Hello Grade 12s, a very warm welcome to all of you. Today I'm going to help you revise the skills that you will need in order to answer source-based questions for your History NSC examination. The section of work that we are going to cover today is the origins of the Cold War, which is question one of History Paper 1. Okay, so let's quickly take a look at what we're going to focus on in today's lesson. So I'm going to start the lesson off with a very brief outline of the origins of the Cold War and what content you should focus on when preparing for this section. Then we will focus on some of the skills that you are required to know when answering source-based questions. The specific skills that we're going to focus on in today's lesson is Level 1 Extraction Questions and Level 2 Interpretation Questions. Now, question one on the NAC History Paper 1 exam focuses on the origins of the Cold War. So when preparing for this section, you need to know how America and the Soviet Union attempted to spread their influence in Europe after World War II. This will include the Iron Curtain, the Policy of Containment, the Truman Doctrine and Marshall Plan, and Common Form and Comic Con. You must also study the Berlin crises with specific focus on the Berlin blockade and the Berlin Wall. Now remember, in accordance to the Grade 12 CAPS document and the examination guidelines, the examiner can focus on any of these aspects. So it is very important that you study all of it. Now when you write your NAC history examination paper at the end of the year, you will not only be examined on your historical content knowledge, but also on the skills needed to study history effectively. These skills are Level 1 Extraction Questions, Level 2 Interpretation Questions, Level 3 Reliability, Usefulness, Limitations and Comparison Questions, and then of course the Paragraph Question. When you're preparing for your examination, it is very important that you study the content as well as the skills. Now, in today's lesson, we're going to be revising some of these skills. We're going to focus specifically on answering level one questions and level two questions. Let's start by taking a look at the mark allocation. When I mark grades of NSC history paper one at the end of the year, then I often find that learners forget to take the mark allocation into consideration. And this means that many learners are throwing away marks unnecessarily. Mark allocation is very important because it tells you how much information the examiner wants you to write down. So let us quickly take a look at what the numbers in the mark allocation actually means. So the first number is the most important number because that number actually tells you how many facts the examiner wants you to write in your answer. The second number will tell you how many marks you will receive for every fact that you write down. And the third number is the total amount of marks that you are going to receive. Now the example in front of you is what a typical mark allocation would look like. It reads 2 times 2 equals 4. The first number means that you have to write down two facts and for each fact that you write down, you are going to receive two marks. So in total, you will receive four marks for that question. So remember, always take the mark allocation into consideration before answering a question so that you don't throw away marks unnecessarily. Now let us take a look at the historical skills that you are going to be required to know at the end of the year. So the first skill that you are taught in history is how to extract evidence from various sources. And the question which an examiner uses to examine the skill is called a level one extraction question. Now, when we extract information from a source, it means that we have to remove that information directly as it is from the source. We are not supposed to make any changes to the wording of it, which actually then means what we are doing is quoting the information from the source. When you are answering a level one extraction question, you are not supposed to paraphrase your answer or write the information in your own words. You are actually supposed to always quote the words as it is directly in the source. 
The only time that you are supposed to write the answer in your own words is when the question actually specifically tells you to do so. But if the question doesn't specifically tell you to do so, then you are always going to quote your answer. Once we learn to recognize level one questions, they actually become easier to answer because we then know that we have to find the answer in the source and quote it. But first, we need to learn how to recognize level one questions. And trust me, it's actually very easy once you get the hang of it. All that you need to do is look out for questions that start with the following words. According to the source, what, when, where, name, list. Questions that start with these words are most likely to be level one questions. Okay, so let's practice to identify and answer a level one question together. The question in front of you reads as follows. According to the source, what was Truman's motivation for the implementation of the Truman Doctrine? Now, how do we know that this is a level one question? Remember the words that we have to look out for. This question starts with the words according to the source, and it also has the word what. So we should immediately be able to identify this as a level one question. And then we know that we have to quote our answer directly from the source, even though the question doesn't actually tell us to quote. But remember, the skill that level one teaches you is to extract evidence from a source, which means ultimately that you have to always quote your answer. But before we go and look for the evidence in the source, we need to understand what is the question actually asking us to quote so that we don't end up quoting the incorrect information. So when we look at this question, this question is asking us to quote something which tells us what Truman's motivation was for implementing the Marshall Plan. Now, in other words, what that means is why did Truman implement the Marshall Plan? Before we go and find our evidence in the source, we also have to know how much evidence we have to look out for, and the mark allocation is going to tell us that. So in this case, the mark allocation is three times one, which means that we are going to quote three reasons for the Truman Doctrine. So let's quickly read through the source together to see if we can find the answer in the source. Okay, so the source says, President Truman of the USA was also worried, though without any real evidence, about the possible Russian control of the Eastern Mediterranean. In 1947, civil war was being fought in Greece between the government and the communists. Truman also feared a possible takeover by Russia of Turkey. He therefore made a speech in 1947 in which he announced that America would be giving economic aid to Greece and Turkey. He also said that the USA would support peoples trying to keep their political freedom. This came to be known as the Truman Doctrine. Now, when we are reading through the source, are we able to quote three pieces of information which tells us why Truman implemented the Truman Doctrine? Yes, we can. Remember, we have to look for Truman's motivation for implementing the Truman Doctrine. So what I've done was I've highlighted the evidence that we can use to answer that question. So Truman's first motivation was possible Russian control of the Eastern Mediterranean. His second motivation was civil war that was being fought in Greece between the government and the communists. And his third motivation was the fear of a possible takeover by Russia of Turkey. Now, all that we need to do is we need to extract that information and we need to write it down as our answer. So this is what your answer is going to actually look like. Can you see that I've quoted the exact words that the source uses? I didn't paraphrase or write it into my own words. And even though the question doesn't ask us to specifically quote, remember when we identify a question as a level one question, 
it means that the rule is we have to quote. Because remember, the skill that this type of question is teaching us is to extract evidence from the source, which means we have to take it out exactly as it is without changing it. Now, the second thing that you need to pick up with my answer is that I have three separate facts written down. And that is because the mark allocation tells me that I have to have three separate facts. Okay, so let's quickly recap what you've just learned. So step number one, you must look for the words to identify the question as a level one question. Who can remember what are those words? According to the source, what, where, when, name, list. Then step number two, you have to read the question carefully to try to understand what the question is asking you to focus on. Then step number three, you're going to look at the mark allocation so that you can know how many facts you have to look for. Step number four, you're going to read the source to find the facts. And step number five, you are going to quote those facts from the source. So if you follow steps number one, two, three, four, and five, then you're actually going to eventually find that answering a level one question is actually very easy. Another type of question that you are guaranteed to get in your NSC examination paper is a definition question. Now you get two types of definition questions. The one will fall under level one and the other one will fall under level two. Definitions are concepts that you were taught in class when your teacher taught you the content of the specific topic. Some examples of definition questions that you could get is communism, capitalism, the Cold War, sphere of influence, the Iron Curtain, satellite states, policy of containment, the Truman Doctrine, the Marshall Plan, dollar imperialism, blockade, and many, many, many more. The important thing for you to do is to identify whether the level question that you are reading is a level one definition question or a level two definition question. So we're first going to take a look at what a level one definition question is going to look like. And the words that we are going to look out for when we want to consider whether or not a definition question is level one is it will say, define the term in your own words. The moment you see those words, then you know that the definition is a level one definition. Now, when we answer a level one definition, we can answer it in a very generic way. So in other words, we don't have to contextualize our definition. We just have to simply write down what it means. OK, so here's an example of what a typical level one question will look like. So the question in front of you reads as follows. Define the term satellite states in your own words. Now define the term indicates that it's a definition question and in your own words indicates that it's a level one definition question. And remember, when we're dealing with a level one definition question, we don't have to link our definition to the Cold War in this case. Our answer can be very generic. So when you're looking at my answer, then you can see that my answer is very generic. I haven't at all linked it to the Cold War. When the definition question has the words define the term within the context of, then you know you're dealing with a level two definition question. And then you are actually required to contextualize the definition. So in other words, you cannot now just write a general explanation of the concept like you would in level one. Now you are required to link your concept to a specific topic. In this case, the Cold War. So here is an example of what a typical level two definition question will look like. So the question in front of you reads as follows. Define the term satellite states within the context of the Cold War. Now you can see that this question is worded a little bit differently to the level one question. 
The difference is that level one says, in your own words, and level two says, within the context of. So that is the biggest difference between the two. Now, when we answer the two different definition questions, our answers are also very different. When we're answering the level one question, remember, we can give a very basic generic definition of the term. But when we have to answer it in a level two version, then we actually have to link our definition to the Cold War in this case, because we have to contextualize it. So when you're looking at my answer over here, then you can see that my answer is a little bit different to my answer in the level one definition question. Over here, I have actually specifically linked it to the Cold War because I've spoken about Eastern Europe, I've spoken about Soviet sphere of influence, and I've spoken about the Cold War. And then I've also indicated that the Soviet Union indirectly controlled these countries. Okay, so let's quickly recap what we've just learned. So how do we identify the differences between a level one definition question and a level two definition question? Remember for a level one definition question, we're gonna look for the words in your own words. Level two is gonna say within the context of. And then remember, depending on the definition question that we get, our answers are going to be different. For level one, our answer can be very general or generic, but for level two, we have to contextualize our answer, okay? Because we are focusing on the Cold War, we will try to link our definition to the Cold War in a level two question. If it's level one, then we don't have to do that because then our definition can be generic, general. Now, another skill that you are taught in history, which is also examined in your NSC examination at the end of the year, is how to interpret evidence from various sources. The question that an examiner uses to examine this skill are called level two interpretation questions. Now, to interpret information means that you need to explain what you understand from the information that's given to you in the source. So when you're writing down your answer, you cannot quote the answer directly from the source. You actually have to explain what the information in the source means, and you have to explain it in your own words. Okay, so just like a level one question, once we learn how to recognize a level two question, they actually become very easy for us to answer because then we know that we have to interpret the information that we are given. The thing is, though, that we first have to learn how to identify a level two question. So just like a level one question, when you're reading a level two question, you have to look out for specific words that are only used in level two questions. These are words like explain. If you see the word explain in a question, then you know automatically that this is a level two question, but because to interpret something means that you have to explain it. Sometimes the question will start with the words, use the source and your own knowledge to explain. But because the word explain is there, you know automatically it's a level two question, and then you are going to have to interpret the information that you are given. Another type of level two question will start with the words comment on. Then you also get level two questions that start with the words, what do you think? Or why do you think? Which ultimately means that you are expected to give your opinion. So you are interpreting information again. And then also you get level two questions that start with the words, explain the messages and those types of level two questions you will usually get when we are dealing with images so either a cartoon or a photograph or even a headline of a newspaper maybe okay so let us practice to identify and answer a level two question quickly so the question in front of you reads as follows Comment on the strained relationship between America and the Soviet Union that is evident in Molotov's speech. Now, when we're looking at this question, 
How do we know that this is a level two question? Remember the words that we need to look out for. This question starts with the word comment. So we should immediately be able to identify it as a level two question. And then we know that we will interpret the information in the source to answer the question. But before we do that, we need to understand what the question is asking us to interpret. This question is asking us to look at Molotov's speech and to comment on the signs of a strained relationship between America and the Soviet Union. Now, the words strained relationship actually means that there is tension growing between America and the Soviet Union. We must identify this tension and then we have to comment on it. Now, to comment on something means that you are giving your opinion on it. So, in essence, the question is asking you to look at Molotov's speech and to give your opinion on the growing tension between America and the Soviet Union. But before we look at Molotov's speech and give our opinion, we need to know how much information we have to write down. And the mark allocation tells us that. This mark allocation says 2 times 2 equals 4, which means that we will have to comment on the tension twice. Now let's quickly go through the source together so that we can find the strained relationship between America and the Soviet Union. Okay, so the source reads as follows. If the USA were to buy up the local industries, take over the more attractive Romanian, Yugoslav and other Eastern European businesses and become the masters in these small countries, it would, in practice, mean the economic enslavement of the small countries and their rule by strong, rich foreign firms, banks and industrial companies. Was this what we fought for? when we battled against the fascist invaders and the Hitlerites and Japanese imperialists? So when we read through the source, are we able to identify the strained relationship between America and the Soviet Union? Can we pick up some tension in Molotov's words? We actually can. So here I've highlighted the part of the source where we can definitely see signs of a strained relationship. We can see aggression in the words that Molotov uses. Now what we have to do is we have to take this information and we must interpret it in order for us to be able to answer the question. So let's look at the first part of the highlighted information in blue. This part reads, the economic enslavement of small countries and they rule by strong, rich foreign firms, banks and industrial companies. So what does Molotov actually mean when he says this? He actually means that America is enforcing dollar imperialism in Europe. In other words, he's saying that they are using money to control Europe. And Molotov uses words like enslavement, which has a very negative connotation to it. This word choice shows us signs of his dislike for America and what they are doing, which makes us see the tension between America and the Soviet Union. The second highlighted part that's in green reads as follows. Was this what we fought for when we battled against the fascist invaders, the Hitlerites and Japanese imperialists? Now, what does Molotov mean when he says this? Molotov is actually comparing America to the Nazis. This comparison also shows us signs of his dislike for America, which again shows that there is tension between the Soviet Union and America. Now what we have to do is we've interpreted the information, so now we have to use this interpreted information to help us to answer the question. So this is what our answer is going to look like when we write it down.
You can see that I've interpreted the information from the source. I didn't quote the exact words. I also didn't paraphrase the words. So in other words, I also didn't just change the words here or there. I actually explained what those specific sentences that are highlighted means. So even if you can find the answer in the source for a level two question, remember, you are not allowed to quote the words that the source uses because it is not an, ex an extraction question. It is an interpretation question. And when I mark the NAC exam at the end of the year, this is a mistake that a lot of learners often make because they see that the answer is in the source. So they automatically use the information that the source gives them directly. But remember, that is the skill that level one is trying to teach you. When you are dealing with a level two question, you cannot quote directly from the source. You have to interpret the work. And remember, when we are interpreting, we are explaining what the information in the source means. So we're going to take the quote and then we are going to explain what we think that quote means. That is going to be our answer. How many times do we have to do it? It says two times two. So therefore we have to do it twice in order to get our four marks. Okay, so let's recap what we've learned so far. So the first step in answering a level two question is you have to identify the question as level two. How do we do so? by looking at the words which the question uses. Who can remember what those words are? Explain, comment on, what do you think? Why do you think? Explain the messages. Use the source and your own knowledge to explain. So when you see those words, then you know that you are dealing with a level two question. And then you know that you have to interpret your answer. The second step is that you need to know what the question is expecting you to interpret. What is the focus of the question? Thirdly, we have to look at the mark allocation because remember, we need to know how much information we have to include. Then we're going to read the source. We're going to try to find the evidence in the source. And then lastly, we're going to take that evidence and we are going to interpret it. We're going to explain what we think that evidence means in order for us to eventually answer the question. So if you follow those five steps, then again, level two questions will become more easy for you to answer. The section of work that we are going to cover today is the civil rights movement which is question three of history paper one. Okay, so let's quickly take a look at what we're gonna focus on in today's lesson. So I'm gonna start the lesson off with a brief outline of the civil rights movement and what content you should focus on when preparing for this section of work. Then we will focus on some of the skills that you would be required to know when answering source-based questions. The specific skills that we are going to be focusing on today is how to answer a paragraph question. Now question three on the NSC History Paper 1 exam focuses on the civil rights movement. So when preparing for this section, you must know the reasons and origins of the civil rights movement, as well as the role, impact and influence of Martin Luther King Jr. and how he supported the concept of passive resistance. You also need to study the various forms of protest during the civil rights movement. This includes Rosa Parks and the Montgomery bus boycott, the sit-ins, freedom rides, the Birmingham campaign, the March on Washington, and the Selma to Montgomery marches. You also need to study the integration of schools and look at Little Rock Nine as an example. And then you need to look at the success of the civil rights movement. In other words, the passing of the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act. Now remember, in accordance to the Grade 12 CAPS document and the examination guidelines, the examiner can focus on any of these aspects. So it's very important that you study all of them. 
Now, when you write your NSC examination at the end of the year, you will not only be examined on your historical content knowledge, but also on the skills needed to study history effectively. These skills are level one extraction questions, level two interpretation questions, level three reliability, usefulness, limitations and comparison questions, and then of course the paragraph question. When you are preparing for your examination, it is very important that you study the content as well as the skills. Now in today's lesson, we're going to be revising some of these skills. We're going to focus specifically on practicing the skills of how to write a paragraph. Now, when you write a paragraph, there are certain steps that you should follow. Let us take a look at these steps. Step one, you have to read the question carefully and identify the topic of your paragraph. You need to keep this in mind since all the information that you will be gathering must be relevant to your topic. Now let's practice this step together. The paragraph question in front of you reads as follows. Use all the sources and your own knowledge to write a paragraph of about eight lines, about 80 words, explaining how John Lewis and other civil rights activists used non-violent strategies in the 1960s to bring about an end to racial segregation in America. What does this question ask us to focus our paragraph on? Here you can see we have to look at the nonviolent strategies which the civil rights movement used to end racial segregation. So now that we have identified the topic, let's look at step two. For step two, you have to read through each source and highlight all the information that you will use to help you to write your paragraph. So remember, you have to look out for evidence of the nonviolent strategies of the civil rights movement and how it ended racial segregation. So when we look at source A, source A tells us that they used passive resistance. It tells us that they trained and were organized. It tells us that they partook in sit-ins and freedom rides and protest marches. And it also tells us that they were successful because the Voting Rights Act was passed. Source B tells us that children became a driving force within the civil rights movement, especially in Birmingham. It tells us that they marched through the streets of Birmingham peacefully and that the police arrested thousands of children. It also tells us that this caused a national outcry which meant that it gave more support for the civil rights movement. It also tells us that they were successful in creating change in Birmingham. Now source 3C is very similar to sources 3A and 3B. When we're looking at the image, then we see that it does indicate to us that the strategies that they used was non-violence. It also tells us that children participated in the civil rights movement and it tells us that police arrested children because when we're looking at the image, then we are seeing children being arrested in the background. And then lastly, source 3D tells us about the March on Washington. It tells us that the March on Washington was one of the strategies to try to end racial segregation. It tells us that this march was well supported. It tells us that it was nonviolent. It also tells us that it put a lot of pressure on the government to actually pass the Civil Rights Act. OK, so now that we've completed step two, we can move on to step three. Step three tells us that we have to think of at least two additional points of information that doesn't feature in the source. Because remember, we were instructed to use the sources and our own knowledge. So this additional information is going to be our own knowledge. 
Okay, so now we're ready for step four. We have to take our information and combine it into a paragraph. When doing so, we must remember that we cannot use the words directly from the source. We may not quote. We have to rewrite it into our own words. And then step five tells us to reference our sources. So you do this by indicating in brackets after each sentence where you received that information. So in other words, if your information comes from source 3A, then you are going to put in brackets after that sentence, source 3A. If the information comes from your own knowledge, then you're going to put in brackets the words own knowledge. And that is going to appear after every single new piece of evidence that you are going to bring into your paragraph. Now the final result, your paragraph will look like this. Remember, the question asked us to focus on the strategies of the civil rights movement and how it led to the end of segregation. So you must make sure that the information that you use in your paragraph focuses on that question. You have to talk about the strategies of the civil rights movement and you need to talk about the successes of those strategies, how it led to an end in segregation. And when you look at my paragraph, then you can see the way in which I structured it is very important for you to take note of. I wrote it in full sentences. I never quoted. I always took the information from the source and rewrote it into my own words. And then importantly, I accredited the sources that I used. I also indicated when I used own knowledge. And remember, it's very important that you use own knowledge because the question tells you that you have to use own knowledge also. Now, when you write a paragraph, you must remember to always do the following things. Firstly, you only ever write one paragraph. You don't write more than one paragraph. Secondly, you must make sure that you write in full sentences. You must also make sure that you reference the sources that you use. Remember, we spoke about it. You put it in brackets next to each sentence and that you also include your own knowledge because remember, the question tells you to include your own knowledge. And then again, you're going to reference that by saying the words own knowledge in brackets. And then lastly, you're only going to include the relevant information that is going to answer the question. Then, things that you should never do when you write a paragraph question. Firstly, you should never include a heading. We don't include headings in a paragraph question for history. Secondly, you cannot write in bullet form. You have to write in a paragraph. And if you are writing in bullet form, that is not the structure that we use for a paragraph. Thirdly, you cannot copy directly from the sources. In other words, you are not allowed to quote the information that the sources give you. You always have to write it in your own words. The fourth thing that you must not do is you must never omit your own knowledge. Because this, the question actually tells you that you have to use your own knowledge, you must make sure that you have at least two own knowledge points. Because if you have a lot of information from the sources and you have no own knowledge, it means that the marker is not going to give you full marks for your paragraph question. So always remember to include your own knowledge points. And then lastly, you don't leave lines open between your sentences. The moment you are going to leave lines open between your sentences, then that means that you are starting to write more than one paragraph. So you must make sure that you never leave a line open between your sentences. We are going to have a look at the extension of the Cold War. And we're going to look at the extension of the Cold War through the case study 
of Vietnam. Vietnam, your educators would have told you, is an essay question. And so when we study and prepare for um, this particular question, we study and pre prepare from that approach of it being an essay question. If you want to have a look at past papers to get an understanding of how the question can be phrased, you can refer to past papers from 2014, 2015 and 2016, as well as 2021, where you will be able to see how Vietnam is phrased as an essay question. But in today's session, I'll also show you an example of two questions. So let's just orientate ourselves with what we're going to be doing in today's session. I thought it would be cute if we number our activities. So number one, we're going to touch on the aspects of the Vietnam War. Two, we're going to look at approaches um, for the focus question for the section. Three, we touch on the stages of the Vietnam War. Then four, I couldn't get something good there, so I thought I'd come with a rhyme. Four, let's do more. So now I want you to start remembering certain things. For point number five, we're going to look at very briefly the period of the 1950s, which we can refer to as the period of the military advisors. And then at six, we look at the 1960s, the period of physical combat or the phase of physical combat, um, along with the withdrawal of the troops at a later stage in the war. And then for the 1970s, we need to remember the ceasefire of 1973 and the fall of Saigon. So I think this is a very nice way for us to remember the most important aspects that we need to remember about this particular focus question in the exams. Number one, the Vietnam War. Number two, approaches to the focus question. Number three, stages of the war. Four, let's do more. Five, the 1950s, period of military advisors. Six is the 1960s for physical combat um, along with the withdrawal of the troops. And then seven is for 1970s, the ceasefire and the fall of Saigon. If you can remember this little slide, then you'll have a good idea of how to prepare for this question in the exams, grade 12. So, the one thing that I promised you we were going to do is look at the two approaches for this focus question. So on the board over here, you are going to see that the question can be phrased along two ways as far as the focus question is concerned. And it's important for us as grade 12 learners to have an understanding of how the question can be phrased so that we can best prepare for it um, and then have an understanding of the different ways that the examiner could possibly ask us this question. So I first want to draw your attention to the left hand side. On the left hand side, the essay question might, might make reference to the USA. It will point out to us that the USA is big and powerful. It might make reference to the fact that the USA is a superpower, or it could relate to the fact that America has so much military might and strength. But at the end of the day, the USA was defeated or unsuccessful with the efforts in Vietnam. So that's the one approach to the focus question that I want you to, to remember. The USA, America is big and powerful and a superpower, but they were defeated. An example for this kind of essay question would be that despite the deployment of troops or soldiers, arms and ammunition, the United States of America failed to prevent the spread of communism. Critically discuss the validity of the statement with reference to the United States of America's involvement in the Vietnam War between 1965 and 1975. And obviously our essays are for 50 marks. So here you've got an example when they're making reference to America's might and power as a military superpower, yet they are unable to defeat um, or stop the spread of communism in Vietnam. So now that we've got that under control, let's look at another approach that the examiner can take when they ask us the question. In this approach, the examiner will point out to us that Vietnam is small. They are a weak country or they were considered weak, right? A small country, but they are able to defeat a superpower.
So if the question comes with this angle and this approach, then we could expect to see a question something along the lines of explain to what extent the tactics and strategies that the Viet Cong used against the United States of America's army were successful in containing the spread of capitalism in Vietnam between 1965 and 1975. Right, so obviously you are now going to point out along those lines that America's tactics are not very successful, but you find that the emphasis will be placed on the Viet Cong's abilities to implement the resources and the tactics and the strategies that they have available to them in order to defeat the superpower, to ensure that the United States of America is unsuccessful. OK, so please watch out for those two focus areas. We said the one focus area will be where America is big and powerful, right? But they defeated. The other focus area would be that Vietnam is small, but they are able to defeat a superpower like the USA. And then also, as we said before, our essay questions are always worth 50 marks, grade 12s. So I need you to remember that when you are studying for your essay, you must ensure that you have enough content, that you've studied enough content, facts and information that you can use as evidence when you answer the essay question in order to get as many marks as you can. I like this image because very often our teachers will encourage us to use mind maps when we study. And if we create mind maps, you can relate it along various ideas, grade 12s. You can either create a mind map for your whole entire essay, or you can decide that you want to do a mind map where you are possibly putting down the basic information that you'd like to remember, that you'd like to understand, and that you'd like to get a better understanding of. So the image on the screen over here is not necessarily the traditional image of a mind map, but I do think that it's visually appealing to us. And so when we start thinking of the Vietnam War and we do this kind of mind map, we can ask ourselves the basic questions in history. What area are we talking about? Where and who is involved? And we know from our lessons in class for the teachers that there are so many role players, right? Um, how does the conflict take place, for example? When does this take place? And also we can look at why it takes place. So at some stage when you are working in class with your educator, you can copy this uh, mind map into your workbooks and you can start plotting that basic information that you need to know in order to help you understand the section of work. But before you do that with your educators, I'd like to give you some ideas of answers to these questions. So let me share the following with you. For the Vietnam War, we need to understand our who. We are talking about the North Vietnam government, right? And we said that they are co um, communist. Then you have the National Liberation Front or the Viet Cong, right? These two groups, the North Vietnamese government that is communist and the Viet Cong, they are against the South Vietnamese government. All right, I'll repeat that. The North Vietnam government and the Viet Cong are against the South Vietnamese government. And your teacher would also have told you that the South Vietnamese government was supported by the USA. So those are our main who role players. Now, something else I want to point out to you, grade 12s, is that sometimes in the beginning when we start doing a section, we might feel uncertain of ourselves in terms of the content that we're going to make use of or how we're going to study our essay. And we really need to start with just the basic baby steps. If we can remember the basics, like North Vietnam is communist, right? South Vietnam is anti-communist. If we can remember that it's the Viet Cong, those are the guerrilla forces, right, who are fighting against the South Vietnamese government because they want North Vietnam and South Vietnam to unite, then we'll do well in history. If you can remember that the USA supports the South Vietnamese government because they want to contain the spread of communism, they don't want the two Vietnam, North Vietnam and South Vietnam to unite under communist rule. So they try to contain the spread of communism and get involved in this Vietnam War. If you can remember those basic elements, then you will do well in this essay. All right.
Let's now have a look at the what that we are talking about. So what is that from 1965 to 1973, the USA sent troops to Vietnam and fought a war to prevent communist North overthrowing the government in South Vietnam. So did you see how easily we did that grade 12? That just by looking at the who and discussing who is involved and you automatically get to a point where you start speaking about your what's and your why's and so on. When we look at the where, and I'm going to show you some more maps later on, when we look at where we are talking about North Vietnam and South Vietnam, right? And we say that the USA bombed various territories in Southeast Asia in the effort to contain the spread of communism. If we look at our time period and our timelines, very often our teachers start speaking about the Vietnam War by giving us the context of World War II and the period after the World War, um, after World War II. But if we want to focus on the Vietnam War, then we are going to focus on that period from 1956 to 1965, when the USA sent military aid and advisors. And an advisor is exactly what the term says. They give advice, all right? Then from 1965 to 1973, we see that the USA is going to send in combat troops. So those are fighting soldiers to fight the Vietnam War. We already discussed ideas around why this is going to happen. North Vietnam was fighting for national liberation and they wanted to unite Vietnam as one country, North and South. The USA though, was fighting for a completely different reason. They simply wanted to make sure that communism could not spread in Southeast Asia. So it would look or it would appear as though America had a real fear of communism spreading in Southeast Asia. So the next slide that we look at focuses on why is the Vietnam War regarded as an extension of the Cold War? And it's simple. We want to look at why the USA became involved in Vietnam. Remember now from when we looked at the origins of Cold War last week that the USA had a big fear about the domino effect, right? That if one country becomes communist, then it will have a ripple effect and other countries surrounding it would also be influenced by communism and they might also become communist or be under the influence of communist governments. So America fears that. Last week, we said that America then develops a foreign policy, a foreign policy of containment in which they want to prevent the spread of communism. The USA feared that if Vietnam became a communist country, then other countries in the region would also turn to communism. Earlier on, I promised you that we were going to look at a map. And here, when we look at our maps, I just want us to orientate ourselves by looking at the maps in order to have a better understanding, a visual understanding of the geographical areas that we are dealing with. So the one here, most of us know where the United States of America is. So this is the United States of America. They are fearing the spread of communism. And because they fear the spread of communism, they bring in their foreign policy of containment, right? So the foreign policy of containment, or if we look at the foreign policy last week, we said it relates to how one country interacts with other countries, right? It's the international policies. So the policy of containment says that they don't want communism to spread. Realistically speaking, America does have reason to worry about the spread of communism. Last week we looked at Russia, right? So we know Russia's communist. We know that there were many Eastern European countries who were either communist or under the influence of Russia and communist powers, right? So Russia is communist. China had become a communist country, and now America was worried that that little piece over here, this green area, Vietnam, was also all going to become communist because North Vietnam was already communist, right? 
So now what I've done is I've zoomed in. You'll see here's China. All right, so on the previous map, I showed you where Russia and China were located, and I tried to point out where Vietnam was, but obviously it's a very small area on the map. So now we zoom in and we can see North Vietnam. So earlier on, we said North Vietnam is the communist area. Then you've got South Vietnam. You've got our Viet Cong rebels over here who are going to be fighting with the support of North Vietnam and the army in order to unite North Vietnam and South Vietnam. And you'll remember that our educators told us that the 17th parallel basically forms the border between North and South Vietnam. Also very importantly, your teachers would have told you about the Ho Chi Minh Trail. It's the supply trail, right? So North Vietnam is supporting the communist rebels in South Vietnam, and they are sending aid, military weapons, uh, medical care, supplies, anything that the guerrilla fighters need in order to continue with the war, and they do so via the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Okay, if we look at our information block over here, it tells us the Ho Chi Minh Trail ran from North Vietnam to South Vietnam, from the north down to the south, through the neighboring countries of Laos and Cambodia. It was used to transport the weapons, supplies and soldiers from North to South Vietnam. Now, three, we need to look at the stages of the war. So we need to get an understanding of what we're going to be speaking about in our essay. Part of the problem that we have grade 12 when you start writing this essay is that very often learners put too much background information into the essay. They start speaking about the end of World War II, um, they're speaking about the Geneva Convention, and all of those aspects are important to help us understand the context of why the Cold War is going to extend into Vietnam. But it's not essential and crucial when we look at our focus questions for the essay on Vietnam. So if if I can remind you about the essay question that we saw earlier on, both of them refer to the period 1965 to 1975. Right now, 1965 to 1975. And earlier on today, when I had a look at last year's question paper, just to refresh my memory, the area focus for the years for this Vietnam question was 1963 to 1975. So you'll see that the focus area focuses itself around the 60s and the 70s. But before we can get to the important parts about the 1960s and the 1970s, we must give the examiner and understanding of the context and the military advisors that the USA had sent in in the period of the 1950s. All right, so let's remind ourselves here. If we look at the stages of the war, we've got three broad stages, depending on which historian you're working with. Some historians actually create more stages of the war, but there are three basic stages that we need to understand. The one is the advisory role, right? And so when you are going to be speaking around the idea of the advisory role, it's a good idea for you to put your context in. Here you can see I've put in a visual clue of the domino theory. So you want to be speaking about the domino theory and America's ideas around containment. America then sends in military advisors, right? From the period of about 1956 to 1965, they are focused on offering the support through military advisors and aid. But then there is an event in 1964 that can con be considered a turning point within the Vietnam War. I just want to remind you also here, grade 12, that we can have multiple turning points within one event. All right, so um, one turning point that we can consider is the Gulf of Tonkin incident in 1964. That you will remember from what your educators told you, right? You've got the military vessels out in the Gulf of Tonkin. The USA declares that their ships have been fired on. And so the Gulf of Tonkin resolution um, is then accepted. And basically what it's going to give is the, the, the US president, the power, right, the authority to do whatever he needs to and the government in order to ensure that America is safe and communism can't spread. This is then going to take 
and make, as we said, a turning point. So now the stage of the war is going to shift from an advisory role into where we see physical combat taking place. Here you are going to speak about the various operations that the American army takes place or undergoes. So you can speak about Operation Rolling Thunder along with the bombing of the Ho Chi Minh Trail, for example. You can speak about the other tactics that the army uses that may be successful or may be unsuccessful when you examine them. Here you can speak about Operation Ranchang, where you can touch on factors such as Agent Orange and its effects. You can also speak about Napalm and so on. Also, under the stage of physical combat, you need to make sure that you are going to touch on the Tet Offensive. Our educators in class have told us that the Tet Offensive related to North Vietnam invading or attacking Saigon. That would be the South Vietnamese capital in 1968. That's going to be another turning point in the war. I'm going to touch on the idea of the Tet Offensive being a turning point in the war again when we start speaking about withdrawal. But you'll notice, Great Dwells, that I've got other bullets in here as well, because there are more factors that you need to speak about. You need to speak about guerrilla tactics, Right, And when we speak about the guerrilla tactics, your focus is obviously going to be on the Viet Cong. Then you need to speak about the growth of the anti-war movement in the world and America. Starts off in about 1965, but it's going to peak in 1968. While you are speaking about the anti-war movement, you also need to make mention of the role of media and whether that promotes the USA's cause or whether you can actually consider it a reason why America is unsuccessful as well. Then you are also going to have a little paragraph on the differing perspectives of the war. So earlier on I said that the Tet Offensive can be regarded as a turning point. And the reason why we regard the, the Tet Offensive as a turning point is because after this invasion and attack, the American government is going to get to a point where they realize that the efforts in Vietnam are largely wasted. And so they're going to start the process of withdrawal. So from 1969, you see the withdrawal of troops, American troops from Vietnam. They also introduce the policy of Vietnamization, right? where they say Vietnam really needs to start becoming self-sufficient now and essentially fighting their own. So this would be South Vietnam, right? They need to start becoming self-sufficient and fighting their own war against the North Vietnam governments. I just want to remind everyone, I heard a slight mic go on and then the person muted themselves. That's great. Just remember, if you make slip ups with mics and um, and video functions, then unfortunately we're going to have to remove you from the session, but thank you. And then after Vietnamization, you've got the ceasefire that's going to come in in 1973. And then in 1975, Saigon, that is now the South Vietnamese capital, is going to fall to the communist north. All right? It reflects poorly on the USA's Cold War efforts, because essentially when Saigon falls, we can consider um, the fact that North Vietnam and South Vietnam will unite and the country is going to be communist. I just want to point out to you when we look at the slide grade um, 12s that you'll see I've got periods over here when I'm mentioning years. Um, Gulf of Tonkin incident in 1964, the growth um, of the anti-war movement from the mid 1960s to um, 1968 when it peaks. I've also got the declaration of ceasefire year in 1973 and 1975 with Saigon. Great twelve. the facts are simple. If you want to achieve excellence in history and get excellent, excellent marks, you need to have a good balance of content that you can use as facts and evidence to support your line of argument. And that brings me to my next point. In order to achieve excellence in history, you need to develop a line of argument, which will include an introduction and a conclusion for your essay. And then also you need to make sure that along with having basic content and a line of argument and an introduction and a conclusion that you are proving to the marker how capable you are as a history learner by including dates. All right. But now let's imagine that you are feeling very uncertain of yourself at this stage of the year. That at this stage of the year, you are simply just trying to get an understanding of the Vietnam War and what it entails, right? 
If that is now the case, then I would advise you to rather leave out the dates when you first do your studying and you're trying to tackle the essay. First, just get a very good understanding of the story, the role players, and what the Vietnam War is about. Then when you have mastered the basics of the Vietnam War, you can start getting to a point where you start including dates. The same with the, with the content. Now, please, and educators must listen carefully. I'm not saying learners are allowed to leave information out of the essays. What I am saying is that if you find yourself struggling, you are really struggling to understand the content, then you need to start working with the basic information first, making sure that you, st you cover the three stages of the war, advisory, physical combat, and withdrawal, right? If I'm a learner that's struggling to understand and grasp and write about these three phases, then I'm going to leave out the paragraph on differing perspectives of war because I need to make sure that I'm sticking to um, core essential content, right? The very basics. But we also know that we are not learners who are just trying to pass history. We want to succeed in our subject. And so as we study, we can get to a point where we start adding more information and packing our evidence to support and produce a line of argument. So at number four, we said, tell us more. So at number four, your history essay must and should have the following. An introduction, a series of paragraphs, and a conclusion. If it doesn't have those basics, we can't call it an essay. But the history essay is not just facts. We need to use the information that we've studied, the content, to answer the question. A high scoring history essay also needs to be well planned. Now, we don't get marks for our planning grade wells, but I would advise you to use some of your time in your formal assessments to actually spend just planning how you're going to set out your essay. So that when you start writing, you can concentrate and focus nicely. For your introduction, I want to remind you of some of the basics. Your introduction needs to establish your line of argument in your essay. This in simple terms means that you need to answer the question which is given in the essay question. Then you need to write a sentence or two to set the scene for your essay. Here you're going to be speaking about the basics around when, where, what, who, and so on in your essay. So if we look at that, we can think about our win. The essay question says our focus area must be 1965 to 1975, right? But I've already told you that we need to make sure we are discussing the three stages of the war. So we're definitely going to be speaking about the 1950s where America has an advisory role. We're going to be talking about Vietnam. We are going to be speaking about the fact that America deployed various strategies to contain the spread of communism. And then we are going to be speaking about our who's as well, which relate to the USA and Vietnam. Now, let's have a look at the reminder of our essay question again. It says that despite the deployment of troops, arms and ammunition, the United States of America failed to prevent the spread of communism in Vietnam critically discuss the validity of this statement with reference to the United States of America's involvement in the Vietnam War between 1965 and 1975. So we've got various types of essay questions in grade 12 and in history, right? Our educators would have spoken to us about it. We've got, do you agree? To what extent? And then we also have critically discuss. Now, in today's lesson, we're not going to focus on the types of essays that we can get, because as we said, we just want to focus on the basics in this particular session. But let's just touch on the idea of critically discussing in an essay. When the examiner says that you must critically discuss, it means that we must critically discuss and analyze. This means that we are going to have to provide arguments that are for and against. So we are not going to necessarily omit any information. If anything, we are going to use the facts, the evidence that we've studied in order to support our arguments of for and against. So if we look at an argument that we're going to be building around for, we would say, so why was the USA's government so unsuccessful and analyze the various tactics? Or were there any instances where America's government can be, an army can be considered successful in our Vietnam War? We also want to look at 
What did the Viet Cong do, the guerrillas do, that was successful? Their tactics and so on. All right. So you need to make sure that you are not only focusing on what the American army does at this stage, but also point out what the Vietnamese army does in or the Vietnamese army of North Vietnam and the Viet Cong. What do they do to ensure that they are able to defeat the South Vietnamese government? Here's my basic introduction. Normally, grade 12, you will remember from, from class that your teacher speaks about a three-step introduction. But we're very aware of the fact that this is early on in the year. And as we said, this particular section, uh, we are hoping to focus on learners who are struggling and find history to be a bit of a challenge so that we can get to you to that point where you feel more confident with the subject. If you are one of those learners, I want to show you this introduction. It's not necessarily the kind of introduction Introduction we're going to use uh, where we want to get 50 out of 50 for an essay, but it does meet the basic requirements of does the learner have an introduction? So remember, you need to take a stance, you must have a position. And when we do that, we are going to do it by paraphrasing the statement that was given to us. And then the next sentence that we need to have in our introduction that's very basic is that we orientate the marker. All right. Remember, I said there is a three step introduction, but we're not going to do three steps today. We're first going to just focus on two. So this is an example of an introduction. Even though the USA deployed various strategies, they failed to prevent the spread of communism in Vietnam. This essay discusses the USA's involvement in the Vietnam War between 1965 and 1975. And so with that grade 12s, those words over there even though, all right? When we write even though, the character shows the marker that they have taken a stance. In the second sentence, they have orientated the marker and told the marker what the essay is going to discuss. This can be our approach for the first time that we write a essay on Vietnam when we are feeling uncertain of ourselves. And then as the term and the year progresses, we can get to a point where we start writing the three step introduction. Is that not so? Because we are all about the growth in history and mastering our subject. I need to just check. Um, here's a question. OK, right. Oh, so we've got a comment from a teacher just coming in there saying that he's struggling with the connection and we get obviously a recording. So we'll share it with the school and then these kids will watch the recording. All right. So for your turn. Because you must also do some work. I've taken the other essay question, the other focus question that I've shown you, and you are going to write an introduction in time with your educating class. Let's now touch on aspects of the body. Um, some of these aspects relate to the ideal essay in history, uh, but as I said, we're also very aware of the fact that some of you at this stage might be finding history a bit challenging, and we want to comfort you with ideas of how you can improve your essay writing. So let's have a go with this. For the body of the essay, we already said you need paragraphs. Your essay can have or should have at least four or five paragraphs, definitely more, but that's basically what we're looking at. Each paragraph should present a different point to support your argument, and then we use our evidence, the facts, to support this point and develop a line of argument. Don't stress if that doesn't make any sense. Later on, I'm going to show you an example of how we do this. Then we use the evidence or the facts. That would be our dates, details, and events to back up the argument, and that is very important. Also remember, grade 12, earlier on I said that if you are struggling with Vietnam, and you are at the starting stages, first get an understanding of the story of the plot, and then you get to a point where you can start filling in the dates and more details. And as we always say in history, you need to use the evidence to develop a line of argument. Now the same applies over here. If you are struggling, the first thing you need to do is understand the content. Once you have mastered the content, you can get to a point where you start working towards developing your line of argument. So for your body, this is the evidence you present in each paragraph, and we're going to make use of the Peel method there. Remember grade 12 in your essays. You do not use headings. We only use headings when we are studying and making notes in class so that we can organize our thoughts. But when we write the actual essay for assessment, no headings, no bullets. 
we write in full sentences because we are history learners. The evidence used in your essay should be written in full sentences and presented in paragraphs. Just as I said, we're going to use relevant information to fully answer the question. We're going to include information which helps answer the question, but watch out for omissions. And yeah, I just want to give you a big warning. Some of the times we find that learners struggle with the Vietnam essay because you've obviously got about an hour to write this essay in and then the learners start off by giving too much background information and then they start running into trouble with their time. Right. So when they start running into trouble with their time, they've already written the background information. Now there isn't enough time to discuss all three stages of the war and the perspectives and the anti-war movement and the role of media. So they omit, they start leaving out important information and that results in the learner losing marks. So please watch out for omissions. Don't start with so much background information that you don't get around to the core business of your essay. And please remember that the mark will acknowledge the background information, but we don't really get marks. We don't get the kind of marks that we are looking for by writing background information. Make sure that you sustain a line of argument in your essay and remember, even though it's important for us to understand the story when we are studying, we are not telling the examiner a story, right? So you are not telling a story in your essay. We are using evidence to answer a question. Here I want to touch on the outline of the key aspects, which we've already spoken about quite a bit today. For the context, we want to look at why Vietnam is regarded as an extension of the Cold War. We want to look at communist North and South Vietnam. We want to touch on the ideas of the leaders, um, Ho Chi Minh from North Vietnam, Dim from South Vietnam. We want to look at the Viet Cong rebels or guerrilla forces, and we want to touch on the idea of the domino theory. That is our context, our background. Try to make it one paragraph, no more than two paragraphs. All right. Now we get to the crux of the essay where the marks are sitting. We need to talk about the stages of the war. So if you have a look at the grade 12 exam guideline that I'm sure your teachers would have shared with you, it makes reference to the stages of the war and it points out three stages of the war. So what we saw coming through last year was that some educators prepared introductions for the learners and it made reference to the three stages of the Vietnam War. And then no matter what the question posed or what the question asked, the learner emphasized, emphasized the three stages of the Vietnam War in the introduction. Grade 12, I'd like to warn you about that. I do know that some of you educators also help you with preparing the content um, that you're going to use in an essay. That isn't a problem, but you can't have your educator or a friend or even you writing an introduction that you've, be, that you've prepared before you go into the exam venue because we don't know what the essay question is. That means that our essay question and our introduction don't relate properly. So you need to get to that point where you are comfortable with attempting to write your own introduction, please. The stages of the war. We said um, pre-August 1964, you need to look at the US military advisors. Then August 1964, um, you've got the Gulf of Tonkin incident. Here you need to speak about what, but very importantly, you need to speak about the result. All right. So there's the incident of the shooting of the um, or the attack on the American um, military ships, and it results in the passing of the re resolution, which is going to give the American government and president a certain amount of authority in order to do whatever they need to, to stop communism and ensure that America is protected. All right. That, that result, that resolution then has a knock on effect to take us into the section where you speak about the combat phase. So from 1965 to about 1968, you have Operation Rolling Thunder. Again here, you're going to speak about the what's, but you need to touch on the aim and the effects that it has. So what is the effect? What is it? What is the impact? Is America successful in stopping the spread of communism? Or are the communist rebels simply more resolute in terms of gaining liberation in order to unite 
North Vietnam and South Vietnam. You're going to speak about Operation Ranch End from approximately 1962 to 1971. You want to look at um, the chemical warfare, for example, that America engages in. What are the aims of it? What's the aim? Don't just tell me that Agent Orange is a defoliation chemical. I want to know why do they make use of this defoliation chemical? So you're going to speak about the fact that the fighting takes place in the jungles and the aim of actually spraying this defoliant is to break down the foliage Right, we'll remember those of us who do life science as well. The foliage relates to the leaves that are on the trees in the jungle, right? Or the plants. So the American government basically wants to break down that foliage in order to see and be able to vet, better find out where the Vietnamese um, guerrilla forces are. What, does, what is the effect of these tactics that America uses? Is it successful? Is America able to win the hearts and minds of the Vietnamese people? Also under combat, you need to touch on um, the period of 1968, that New Year, Tito Offensive, what happens and why is it considered a turning point in the war? Then you also need to focus on your Vietnamese guerrilla warfare. Even if the essay asks you to speak about and focus in the question, ask you to focus on America's tactics, we can't discuss America's tactics in a critically discussed essay if we are not speaking about the, um, the guerrilla forces tactics as well, right? Um, it's it's not practical. The whole point is that we critically discuss, which means we look at the positives and the negatives. It means we must look at the entire picture, what the USA is doing and what the guerrilla forces are doing. Then you need to make mention of the anti-war movement, we said. Here you are going to touch on the draft system, war veterans. You can speak about the Mille massacre. Very importantly, you need to touch on the use of media. You can also touch on the civil rights movement and the black power movement and their anti-war stance and perspectives. You can speak about the loss of life that was suffered on both sides and how America's strategy of winning hearts and minds failed. All right. Um, then you need to speak about Vietnam as well. The fact that they are fighting for self-determination, that's the right for them to make their own decisions and unite. OK, so they're fighting for self-determination against the South Vietnamese government. Earlier on, we said, though, that the USA was simply fighting to contain the spread of communism. In 1969, you're going to start with the fact that Nixon starts withdrawal of troops and the implementation of the Vietnamization policy. You'll remember earlier on, I said that if you are struggling to write of it, then you might not want to include all of the dates immediately, that you might want to hold back on some of your doubts as you become more confident when you write your history essays. Also very important for this essay, we said, EU is 1960, um, 1973 ceasefire that is negotiated. So it's the stopping of the fighting. And then we said in April 1975, right, the South Vietnamese government falls, Saigon is captured, and the two countries will then unite under communist rule. That is evidence that America lost. Earlier in the presentation, we made reference to making use of the Peel method. So let's briefly remind ourselves that first you need a point that will be an opening sentence of your paragraph where you are going to make a clear statement or point. Then you're going to explain the next sentence in your paragraph should explain the point that you have just made. We must offer evidence as history learners because we are not only telling story. Instead, we are using historical facts to build a line of argument. So for evidence, the next few sentences should give evidence or facts to substantiate the statement that you've made. And then we must have a link. At the end of your paragraph, you must link back to the essay question or forward it um, or move forward to the next paragraph. You'll see I've made a note over here that when I speak about evidence, it's going to involve everything. Facts, details, dates and figures. All right. But please make sure that the dates that you use are correct. This is information regarding the development of the line of argument. I'm not going to touch on it today, but you can have a look at the slide in class with your educator. We'll discuss how to do our line of argument in greater detail um, 
as we progress through our courses of power hours. So let's just remind ourselves about the introduction that we wrote early on. All right. We said that even though the USA deployed various strategies, they failed to prevent the spread of communism in Vietnam. This essay discusses the USA's involvement in the Vietnam War between 1965 and 1975. Now, Great Wells, I'd like to show you a paragraph where I've got a point, I explain, I give an example, and I offer a link. And this is an example of a background paragraph where I try to make reference to all the key and important points that will give a context for a good Vietnam essay. So in green, you will see the point, then the yellow section relates to explaining, the gray section relates to providing examples, and the red section relates to offering a link either back to the question or the link is going to help push us forward to our next paragraph. So let's see how it goes. After 1945, because of the Cold War, the USA adopted a policy of containment. They wanted to prevent the spread of communism to other parts of the world. The Truman Doctrine stated that the USA would support any country trying to resist the threats of communism. According to the domino theory, the USA was concerned that if South Vietnam became a communist country, then other countries in the region would also turn to communism. Link, as a result, the USA was drawn into Vietnam's localized war that extended US um, involvement in the Cold War. So you'll see this paragraph over here um, offers a point it explains information, example, and a link gives very brief background information. All right, now we go on. We're busy with our number five as well now. So we're also going to start touching on what is happening in the 1950s as we make our way forward. In the early stages of the struggle between North and South Vietnam, the USA was not directly involved. The USA supported Dim's capitalist South Vietnamese government, but it was not very popular with the peasants who made up 80% of the population. In North Vietnam, the communist government introduced land reforms, education programs, and they nationalized industry to uplift the condition of the peasants. In South Vietnam, though, Dim was a capitalist, but a dictator. Land was taken from the peasants and given to Dim supporters. The USA government sent military advisors, remember in the 1950s, and aid to support the South Vietnamese government because they feared the growing support for communism inside South Vietnam. This meant that the USA strategy was aimed at containing the spread of communism through indirect involvement in the first stage of the war. So you will notice, Great Wells, that I've made reference to the first stage of the war, and that is fine. You don't have to refer to the particular stages as one, two, and three. The marker will be able to pick up that you've made reference to stage one, two, and three. Okay. Then, we get to six, which we said related to the 1960s, right? So here we're looking at Gulf of Tonkin and onwards, where America is going to provide U.S. troops. Do you see how helpful my numbering system was in the beginning? The USA deployed combat troops in 1965 and, um, and the period until 1968 saw the most direct involvement of the US troops or the USA troops. After the attack on the American Navy in the Gulf of Tonkin, the US believed that if they did not send in an army to support the South Vietnamese government, then it would soon fall the North, to the North Vietnamese and the whole of Vietnam would become a communist country. By the end of 1965, there were 200,000 US troops in Vietnam. Their conventional warfare tactics did not work in the jungle against the guerrillas. Operation Rolling, Operation Rolling Thunder saw sustained aerial bombings of the North Vietnamese targets and the Ho Chi Minh Supply Trail. Now you see, I will put in a note over here where I'm saying you need to supply more examples. Because of this, the US failed to win the locals' hearts and minds. I'm forming a link now. In fact, the locals supported the Viet Cong rebels um, who used guerrilla tactics. I'm thinking to myself, Great Wells, that sounds like a natural link into a paragraph about 
guerrilla communist tactics. Right, so now it's your turn again. With your educating class, you are going to write your own paragraph about guerrilla tactics used by the communist guerrillas. But that is not all that your essay needs. You are also going to write your own paragraph about the, Ameri the American anti-war movement. And remember, while you are writing about the American anti-war movement, also include the role of media. Then you can write another paragraph where you write your own paragraph about different perspectives or points of view. It doesn't need to be a long paragraph, grade 12s, just one or two points. One point on America's perspective, another point on the Vietnamese perspective. Then you are going to start getting to seven, the 1970s, right? Where we talk about the Tet Offensive as a turning point, and now we're going to move into the ceasefire and the fall of Saigon in the 70s. So the Tet Offensive, that would be a surprise attack on Saigon by the North Vietnam Army and Viet Cong, was a turning point. The Viet Cong's losses were huge, but it showed that the USA's efforts were failing and they were not winning the war as America as America's at home had thought or were led to believe. The escalating cost of maintaining the war and the growth of the anti-war movement inside the USA made the USA government question how to withdraw from Vietnam. So in 1969, the US President Nixon introduced the policy of Vietnamization. The strategy was aimed at planning to equip and train the South Vietnam Army to take the place of U.S. soldiers to become more self-reliant. By 1973, Nixon withdrew the U.S. troops, but the civil war in the country continued. When Saigon fell to North Vietnam in 1975, it proved without a doubt that the USA's efforts at containing the spread of communism in Vietnam through military deployments had failed. So there we've developed our line of argument again and made reference to, direct reference to America's use of the armed forces. Just on this point, while I'm showing you the paragraph grade 12s, I also want to remind you, if you're feeling uncertain about yourself, start off by writing short sentences. Sometimes it's easier for us to understand when we write shorter sentences, right? And then when you become more confident and you understand all your content, you can start writing longer sentences in history. Obviously, as we said before, if you are aiming to get 50 out of 50 or 100 percent for the essay, you need to make sure that you are writing slightly longer essays uh, where you've got linking words, right, that link to your line of argument. But if you are finding history to be very challenging, don't be afraid to start off with shorter sentences so that you can build your confidence and improve on your essay writing. So that's a reminder of the introduction that even though the USA deployed various strategies, they failed to prevent the spread of communism in Vietnam. This essay discusses the USA's involvement in the Vietnam War between 1965 and 1975, which means I now need a conclusion. So for my conclusion, your conclusion should restate your line of argument to the answer given. So you can't decide to change. You can't in the introduction take one stance and then in the conclusion say, no, I was wrong. All right. You need to make sure that you've got the same line of argument throughout your whole essay where you've weighed up Vietnam. All right. And the Viet Cong um, communist guerrilla forces. So it should be the same line of argument which was stated in the introduction and then developed in the body of your essay. So here's an example of a basic conclusion for us. One can conclude that despite all the military tactics, right, um, it was evident that the USA failed to prevent the spread of communism in Vietnam. This became clear when America started its policy of Vietnamization and withdrew its armed forces from South Vietnam. The superpower failed to contain the spread of communism. So with that, I've got a very clear statement around the fact that America's efforts in Vietnam fails.